Today on JSECIO Live, breaking news, a major victory in Oklahoma on coerced abortions. We'll talk about it today with a state legislator who led the charge along with ACLJ attorneys. Live from Washington, D.C., Jay Seculo Live. Phone lines are open for your questions right now. Call 1-800-684-3110. That's 1-800-684-3110. And now, your host, Jordan Seculo. Hey, folks, welcome to Jay Seculo Live. This is Jordan Seculo. We are taking your phone calls, 1-800-684-3110. That's 1-800-684-3110. And, you know, we talk a lot about fighting for life at the federal level, whether it's federal courts, federal legislation. Than talks about, you know, the federal moves in Congress, attempts to defund Planned Parenthood or cut out funding to Planned Parenthood like the Trump administration has done. But one aspect of the ACLJ that I don't think gets enough attention nationally when we're on our radio broadcast all the time is all the works we're, all the work we're doing in the states, working with state legislators, working with governors, sending out the same ACLJ legal experts who focus in on this issue, uh, who work in the federal level, but can also work in the state level in crafting uh, good laws that will almost certainly always be challenged in court. So we get brought in to help assist those state legislators and governors in crafting the best laws possible to survive legal scrutiny. And of course, fighting for life, it's always worth the battle, even if that battle means all the way into the Supreme Court. We mentioned it briefly yesterday, but Oklahoma passed a new uh, law signed by uh, the governor there, and I think that's very important to point out. So this was passed by the Senate, passed by the passed by the Senate 37 to 9. The House voted 76 to 18. It's Senate Bill 1728, the Unborn Person wrongful death act and it actually gives a cause of action when a coercive abortion an abortion based off fraudulent information has been performed uh, for instance uh they've done stu- they did studies in oklahoma and found that how many uh, uh women were not even getting the basic informed consent that is required under under oklahoma law or ultrasounds that are required under oklahoma law so what happened well the aclj team uh, led by Walter Weber, uh, one of our most senior attorneys, on, and especially focused in on the life issue, really uh, someone uh, w- so well-known in the pro-life circles in the United States and around the world in his work protecting the unborn, uh, helped lead the charge with uh, our other senior attorney, Ben Sisney, who's done a lot of work at the state levels on life, and they'll both be joining us on the broadcast today. They worked with Oklahoma. They worked with the, st- the state legislators. They worked with uh, the governor's office. They worked with state senators, state house members. And just take a listen. And this uh, state legislator will be joining us today on the broadcast uh, from Oklahoma. He's Oklahoma's House Majority Floor Leader, uh, Representative John Eccles. He helped draft and advance the bill. And he had this to say, quote, Without the support of the ACLJ, this bill would not have become law. The bill I'm holding in my hand right now, an act relating to abortions creating the Unborn Person Wrongful Death Act. It would not have become law. Their team, talking about the ACLJ, worked diligently with both myself and other legislators to make sure we were able to pass this law to protect Oklahoma's unborn. So we're going to talk uh, to him about this, then we're going to talk to Walter Weber about the work. But Than, this just to me, it underscores, I want to take people's phone calls, 1-800-684-3110. The ACLJ is much broader than just a federal-based organization. No doubt about it, Jordan. And look, a lot of the work that you do hear about on this broadcast that's at the federal level, the very purpose for it, Jordan, is to free up some of this work on the state and local level. You've got to work on the macro level, Jordan, but unless you have boots on the ground working on these types of efforts, the ultimate result is not live saved. From this bill, Jordan, the result will be live saved and also recourse for those who are wronged by the abortion industry. Folks, this is a great time. You know, we haven't done it often during COVID and and all the things, uncertainty, but I know a lot of people are getting back to work. If you can support the work of the ACLJ, this work continues as the pandemic goes on. Support the work of the ACLJ. Donate online right now. Tax deductible. ACLJ.org. Stand up for life. Help us in the battle. 
Thanks to your support of the ACLJ, we have had many victories. The IRS, now uh, formally apologizing to Tea Party groups. The IRS did the right thing by resolving the case with an injunction that mandated a complete change of the IRS nonprofit tax exempt work as it relates to issue advocacy organization. If any group feels like they're being targeted, they can go to federal court and bring our case. That's a victory. It's one of the most significant wins in the ACLJ's history, to take on the IRS and win. For more than 27 years, the ACLJ has been fighting for freedom and liberty in the United States and around the globe. These are, are young people in their 20s and 30s that are doing this, are fighting for life at a whole new level to beat back the abortion juggernaut. We've got a whole group of young lawyers that are defending them. Those of us that believe in life know that we're on the right side of history. We understand full well children are children, and they're precious in God's sight, and they're precious in our nation's sight, and they're precious to parents. But I actually think we're winning. This is one of the social issues we're winning. The release of Andrew Brunson. He is the American evangelical from North Carolina, held in Turkey for more than two years. They're rushing us to the airport, and uh, there was an Air Force plane that came from Germany that had been on standby. We're flying, and they finally left Turkish airspace. It's like, okay, now we're really, we're really out of Turkey and, and free again. We're grateful to ACLJ who put it out to these people, you know, who were, they were getting all this out. All of the people who prayed for us through ACLJ and through your contacts, I'm thankful, I'm grateful, and actually I'm astounded. We need your help as we continue this work here in the United States and around the world. Join us online at the American Center for Law and Justice at aclj.org. Folks, if you're watching on Periscope or Facebook, let me encourage you to sh click that share button right now because, again, this is the kind of information it's just not breaking through the national news cycle right now. And I know that people that follow you on Facebook and Periscope and our radio listeners, you care about the life issue and you care about it nationally. And you also care about what's happening in the states across the country. If you've got phone calls for us about what happened in Oklahoma, give us a call 1 800 684 3110. It's a great time to do it because we are joined by one of the leaders in this effort in Oklahoma to pass this pro life uh, legislation, get it signed by the governor that provides a cause of action when you see these coercive abortions. And we'll explain what that means. Uh, it is great to be joined by House Majority Floor Leader, uh, Representative John Eccles of Oklahoma. He joined us once before when we were going around the country talking to state leaders about uh, COVID-19 and the response there. But uh, it's, I think, even better to have you on today, Leader Eccles, uh, talking about this great victory in Oklahoma for life. Tell people what this legislation does. Absolutely. And, and Jordan, it's an honor to be on, and thank you for having me. I just appreciate so much uh, what the ACLJ does nationwide. And I, I got to start off before we go. This bill would not have passed but for the work the ACLJ put in. And your listeners probably want to know, when I say the work, I don't just mean talking about it. You literally sent lawyers like Ben Sisney and others to Oklahoma. You were in in the meetings. You were in in the drafting of this bill. I remember the meeting to the Senate pro tem's office. And, and what we did is really unique. With your help, we created a bill that would allow a private cause of action for the coercive nature and the coercive actions that we know these abortion providers are doing when they don't follow the proper steps. When they either trick a woman into doing it, they don't let her know all of her options, or even more deceptively, they don't let her know all of the, the ramifications and the clinical reasons we know it is, it is hard on the body in addition to the life issue, but it's just hard on the body to have these things, um, and it's a really creative way to hold these abortion providers accountable. So this is what I think is so interesting, and I, and I so appreciate uh, you mentioning the ACLJ's work here, because I think a lot of that, you know, uh, we don't brag about that. We tell people, of course, that we do this work. Uh, but I think to hear from you, to hear from a state legislator be, uh, because of, you know, resources and needing the expert advice, the commitment that we're able to make to send in those experts, Ben Sisney, Walter Weber, to be there from the drafting stage 
it, it takes kind of like what we do at the federal level, but at the state level, uh, which is just as important, sometimes even more important in the battle for life. And this is uh, legislation, of course, we come in, uh, Leader Eccles, because we want to help make sure we craft, help you craft the best legislation possible, because as you know, uh, they're always going to have to likely survive legal scrutiny. That's exactly right. And that's what we have to be prepared for. And so the listeners know this was such a unique experience for me. Um, we met in the pro Tim's office. You know, Mr. Weber, Mr. Sisney came in. We had Oklahomans for life. So we had national leaders uh, for the pro-life issue. We had local leaders for the pro-life issue. And we hammered this out because we all know these are going to be challenged in court. And we, we know that's coming, even though this is such a common sense piece of legislation. We're talking about protecting the woman, who we, and that's what we want to do as pro-life. We want to protect the woman. We want to protect the child. We want to protect life on all forms. Um, the idea that this isn't just 100% no-brainer, uh, I have my own views of the abortion industry and know why, because that's what it is at the end of the day. It's an industry um, that fights things like this. But to have that support as a state legislator uh, was incredible. It was, it was a big deal. It's not what we get from a lot of national organizations. I get a lot of air support, which is great. But boots on the ground, that was a big deal. You know, I, I read through this and, and what it does, too, and, and as an attorney, and this is why it's so important, folks, that if you want to call us on the air, 1-800-684-3110, Leader Eccles joining us now. This has become the state law of Oklahoma. Uh, the, the governor has signed this into law. I know uh, a state senator, uh, also uh, Boulard, was very important in this, and I'm sure a lot of other members, uh, like you mentioned, uh, uh, Leader Eccles, but I just think it's important for people to understand what this does. So as a consequence um, of having this specific uh, bill, it defines a wrongful death suit under this bill, including if a doctor performs an abortion on a minor without parental consent. And, and then we, there's been studies done, and this was used to craft the law, that as many as 69% of abortions in the U.S. are performed without full legal consent. 69%, whether that's consent because it's a minor or consent because of the ultrasound uh, rules that are in different places. I mean, Leader Eccles, to me, that is that is shocking. But but we know from the abortion industry, it, we call it abortion distortion. They get treated differently than any other business, than any other organization, than any other medical provider. They never seem to have to be able, seem to have to play by the same rules that everyone else does. It's exactly right. Could you imagine the necessity? We wouldn't even need this bill if people were doing orthopedic knee surgeries without proper consent. They'd be sued out of existence tomorrow. If people were doing back surgeries without proper consent, they, they, they'd be done. We take those doctors' licenses. But for listeners from the state of Oklahoma, I mean, we remember we had an abortion doctor that lived in the nicest neighborhood in all of Oklahoma City, one of the biggest one of the biggest houses that was literally burying dead babies in mass graves. I mean, th this is just wicked on all forms, and, all forms and fashions. It breaks your heart. And to take on that industry, and all we're saying is they need to be treated the same way as everyone else. And it's important as conservatives, we're intellectually honest on the pro-life argument. That's what the ACLJ helped us do, because absolutely, I wish we could stop abortion tomorrow. If I had that... In my ability, I would do it. But it, we all want that. But in the meantime, we have to say they got to stop getting special treatment, which is what they get, and they have to be held accountable for their bad actions. And that's what this bill does. It creatively, in a, in a very creative manner, uses the legal system. And I hope this becomes the standard throughout the nation. I hope what the ACLJ helped us start in Oklahoma, uh, Senator Bullard, Representative Gann, Pro Tem Greg Treat. Uh, myself, Speaker Charles McCall, I hope this becomes the new standard and we stop giving this industry special treatment. Thank you, Bennett, here. I really appreciate that. And I actually just wanted to follow up on that point very uh, quickly and ha have you expand on it just a little bit, because we talk on this broadcast, Leader Eccles, a lot about how we need to take back the vocabulary here. We need to take back the mantle of being pro-choice or anti-choice. Uh, that really, to me, is what this is all about. This is a pro-woman piece of legislation, and here's why. Let me just give our listeners a little bit, a bit of background, and then maybe you can expand on it. We know for a fact that coercion 
uh, to get an abortion does not just happen from those in, in a mother's life, whether it be a partner or a father or whoever it may be. We also know, Leader Eccles, it comes directly from inside the abortion industry. Planned Parenthood's own numbers show that they have nearly 350,000 abortions every year, and they only uh, treat patients that, that end up doing a live birth, having a live birth, uh, to the to the tune of five to six thousand. That is coercion, and yet the abortion industry is pushing these mothers into a decision without giving them proper choice. So, speak for a moment, if you would, about how this uh, piece of legislation actually empowers women. It gives them the information to do what to make a choice. And the reason the abortion industry opposes it, I think, is because they know when a woman gets that choice, more times than not, they're going to choose life. Is that what you found? That's exactly what we found. And, and you, boy, you just nailed it spot on. We've been on this journey in Oklahoma for a while for supplying resources to women. I passed a bill two years ago that put $2 million in the funding for organizations that help women choose life, by the way, was, was opposed by my, the entire Democrats in the House. Then in this bill, which ended up being opposed, what, what's insane about that opposition to any of this is all we're doing is saying a woman is entitled to, they, are, they, are, they are, need to be treated equally, and they need to know all of the ramifications of their procedure. What should be offensive is that anyone would argue they're not, because I've gone through this in any other medical procedure. Everyone would agree, full and complete uh, transparency, full and complete disclosure of the risks, of what, of what your options are. We demand that. But for some reason in abortion, we know what is going on. We know that there's coercion. We know that there's failure to report child abuse. I mean, we have case after case. We, have, we, have no, we know that they're doing abortions on minors who are admitting that they've been sexually abused, sometimes by people that actually live with them, and they're doing the abortion anyway. This is, without reporting it, this is, this is disgusting. And this empowers women, because right now what gives them to do all it says is they get to know all of their options. They have to have all of the legally required disclosures. The fact that this didn't pass with 100% is actually mind-blowing. You know what, Leader Eccles, let me thank you for your leadership on this issue. You know, we can provide all that expert advice, but we've got to be asked to do it. And so we're grateful for you and, and members of the Oklahoma legislature to bring us in to help. We've got the experts, but we've got to be asked to do it. And you did. Uh, for, to check out and learn more about uh, a leader, Eccles, johneccles.com. That's J-O-N-E-C-H-O-L-S. I tweeted that out as well so you can follow him on Twitter. He stands strong for life, and I bet he agrees. Something we're going to be talking about tomorrow. This new message that's kind of popping up. How about defund Planned Parenthood, not our police departments? We'll be right back on J Secchio Live. Remember, support the work of the ACLJ. You're just learning about some of the work we're doing right now. ACLJ.org. Donate. Can you tell me how many of your affiliates receive the majority of their revenue from abortion? I don't know that answer. Could you get it for me? I'll talk to my team. I think what we need to look at is the business of abortion. And the business of abortion starts with a sale. An organization is chopping up children and selling the body parts uh, to the highest bidder. They can call it whatever they like. The reality is they've been caught red-handed. I was told that it was just a blob of tissue. She looked me dead in the eye. She said, it's not a baby. It's a blob of tissue. We really did treat women like second-class citizens. Do not ever kid yourself. They know exactly what they're doing. We were driven by this quota. I didn't want the baggage in all honesty, of having a child. I, I pretended I was fine, but I wasn't fine. She said, this is the best choice for you. They're in the business of abortion. They worship at the altar of abortion. Most people working in the abortion clinic make more money than they can anywhere else. We would talk to them about gestational dates and what sort of abortion they could um, they could do, whether it was the medication abortion or the surgical abortion, depending on how far along they were. Um, we would talk briefly about what the procedure would actually be like. I remember getting a, a directive from my supervisor, you know, that we, we didn't want to give them too much information about the abortion procedure. We didn't want to talk to them about risks um, associated with the procedure because we didn't want to scare them out of having an abortion. Does no one see what's really going on in America? Is this really who we're going to be? 
We at the American Center for Law and Justice have been dedicated to the fight for life for over three decades. Whether it's at the District Court, the Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court of the United States, or in the halls of Congress. We are part of the fight. We want you to be there with us. Go to ACLJ.org right now. ACLJ.org. Folks, you just heard from Oklahoma leader in, in the state house there, uh, John Eccles, and his praise for the ACLJ and this pro-life legislation that was uh, passed by the state Senate, the state house, signed by uh, uh, the governor there as well, Governor Stitt, uh, in Oklahoma. And he had this to say, uh, uh, and he repeated it again on the air, and I appreciate that so much because he said, without the support of the ACLJ, this bill would not have become law. Their team, and he was talking about Walter Weber, who's about to join us on the air, and Ben Sisney, who will be joining us later in the broadcast, worked diligently with both myself and other legislators to make sure we were able to pass this law to protect Oklahoma's unborn. About to talk to Walter Weber about the process, but Than, I want to talk to you here because it's just a reason why. I know as people are getting back to work and maybe getting a little bit more financially stable, and for those who are, It's a great reminder of why to support the work of the ACLJ. It's a tax-deductible donation. But it's not, though you're in Washington, D.C., and we focus so much on kind of news of the day, we also want to use this hour that we have each uh, each day on our broadcast to remind people about the big battles that we fight all over the country and the resources that we put into it would not be available without our donors. Yeah, I want people to think about this, Jordan. I mean, when a young mother walks into an abortion clinic looking for options in a difficult situation, and then she ultimately is coerced into an abortion, and that really does happen, Jordan. We can document that. Uh, She should have legal recourse, and that's what this bill does. And look, we at the ACLJ, we're eager to engage in those cases, but it really does take two things, Jordan. And you touched on one of them in the last segment of the broadcast. It takes a partnership, very often an invitation from a state legislature for us to get involved. And then, Jordan, it just takes resources. Look, we're set up here in Washington, D.C. to engage the federal issues on a moment's notice, and that is critically important. But when you're going to engage one of these state-based issues, very often, as Leader Eccles said, it takes boots on the ground. It takes sending attorneys on the ground to help with the drafting, to help with the legal defense. And by the way, Jordan, this is far from over. Uh, Leader Eccles is correct. This is going to get challenged in court, and we're going to have to continue to devote those resources to it. So I would just say this to folks out. If you want that young mother to have legal recourse in Oklahoma and you would like the ACLJ to stay partnered with Oklahoma in that, uh, you play a role in this. Yes, we need the partnership with the legislature. Jordan, we also need the resources to be able to send the legal staff out into the field, out into the states to be able to do that work. You know, folks, to support the work of the ACLJ, let me encourage you right now, you can donate online at aclj.org. That's aclj.org. It's how Walter Weber can get out to Oklahoma with Ben Sisney and spend that time with those state legislators crafting this pro-life law that you just heard about from Leader Eccles in Oklahoma that became the law of the land in Oklahoma. It was signed by the governor in Oklahoma. And it's a kind of a new approach. And so donate if you're able to. I know some are not right now because of the pandemic, because of what phases you're in, your business you're in. But if you're able to, or if you're now back on your feet and able to support again the work of the ACLJ, I encourage you to do it so that we can continue to do this work, not just in Washington, D.C., not just around the world, but around the country as well, in states across the country. You see, we are the experts that are brought in, but we've got to have those experts ready to go and the resources ready to do it. Donate online at aclj.org today and support the work of the ACLJ. Now, let me go to Walter Weber. Walter, Leader Eccles, uh, you're a senior counsel with the ACLJ. You've been working on the life issue since uh, I, probably before I was born and since I was very young. But but you went out to Oklahoma and working with uh, Ben Sisney and those uh, members in the Oklahoma legislature. Just, just uh, let people understand what's unique about this law that Oklahoma Uh, passed and signed by the governor because it allows this kind of cause of action. Sure. Thanks, Jordan. Well, you know, when I was originally contacted by Senator Bullard about doing something in Oklahoma, the question that I I asked is the one that I always ask when I'm asked to to, uh, weigh in on potential legislation. Two questions. Is it constitutional and is it meaningful? 
And when I say constitutional, now I'm, I'm operating under the land that we're in, which is the post Roe versus Wade world. I, ideally, bans on abortion, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to deal with all the different restrictions you face under the current case law. But that's what it is right now. So the first question you have to ask is, is it something that's going to be able to be defensible in the courts? And the second thing is, is it going to actually accomplish something? Is it going to be meaningful either as an educational tool or as a test case or as something that's going to actually be able to be upheld in the courts and, 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 and do something? So the approach that we took with the Oklahoma law uh, is the civil remedy approach. That's not the standard approach. Usually you think of laws that, that impose criminal restrictions right. on either doing abortions under certain circumstances or in certain ways. What we wanted to do was empower the people who were the post-abortion victims, the people who have been misled or forced or taken advantage of uh, in going through the abortion process. And now afterwards they realize that they didn't know what they were doing. They weren't able to give their consent, uh, and they want, they want to be able to get relief. Um, Think about it, Jordan. In this country, we hear a whole, whole lot about criminal rights, right? You right. can't waive your rights unless your waiver is fully informed right. and voluntary. Well, what separates abortion from murder or, or homicide or wrongful death? It's the consent of the mother, right? right? We, have, we have a scheme in this country where simultaneously you can have somebody prosecuted for attacking a pregnant woman and killing her baby because that's homicide. At the same time, Planned Parenthood could do the same thing, and it's not homicide. The only difference is the woman's consent. And our, our position, and I think this should be a 9-0 vote on the Supreme Court or any other court, is that woman's consent has to be fully informed and voluntary. And that's what the Oklahoma law does. It targets that lack of either uh, voluntariness or full informed consent. I mean, we see these reports, Walter. I mean, it's pretty shocking. In Oklahoma, they cited this in their legislation and in their report when they were going through by why it was necessary. In these reports, that sixty nine percent of abortions in the u s are performed without that full legal consent. So that would mean that there would be a lot of potential, you know, in Oklahoma, but if this was adopted in other states, we have a question about that I'll ask you about in a minute. but that that's a, a whole lot of folks. I mean, that's nearly seventy percent of abortions being performed illegally because they're not following the consent rules. I think there's a lot of silent misery out there that we're not hearing about. Yes, there are a lot of women who stand up, say they regret their abortions, say that they were deceived or railroaded into it. Uh, but that takes a lot of courage. And, uh, and, and I think we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. You know, Walter, a question that came in, and this came in through uh, Facebook, and I encourage people who are watching on Facebook and Periscope, share this with your friends and family. If you want to talk to us on air, if you've got questions for us, one eight hundred six eight four thirty one ten. This question came in, and it was uh, uh, basically from Shane Kitchen, and he said, "Could a piece of legislation like this be used or adopted in other states?" And Walter, I know we'd be happy to assist other state legislators to do this. So, but but could it be adopted in other states, kind of very similarly? Definitely, definitely. Yeah, Jordan, this is something that I think could uh, could like, as Leader Eccles said, could serve as a model for other states. Uh, I mean, one of the, the issues that we face in abortion cases is the abortionists claiming to stand in the shoes of the women, represent them, when in fact they have adverse interests. So this, this bill and, and civil remedies like this expose that difference. There's a conflict of interest between the woman who is being railroaded and the abortion operator who's trying to make a profit. Walter, I'm going to hold you over for the uh, next segment of the broadcast because I want to ask you about what we all know is the coming legal challenge because for it to become that kind of model it will likely need to survive what we can always predict when it comes to abortion and life a legal challenge so walter will be joining us too 1-800-684-3110 remember we do this because you financially support the work of the aclj you donate to us tax deductible donate online today at aclj.org Thanks to your support of the ACLJ, we have had many victories. The IRS now formally apologizing to Tea Party groups. If any group feels like they're being targeted, they can go to federal court and bring our case. That's a victory. It's one of the most significant wins in the ACLJ's history, to take on the IRS and win. For more than 27 years, the ACLJ has been fighting for freedom and liberty in the United States and around the globe. 
These are, are young people in their 20s and 30s that are doing this, are fighting for life at a whole new level to beat back the abortion juggernaut. But I actually think we're winning. This is one of the social issues we're winning. The release of Andrew Brunson. We're flying and they finally left Turkish airspace. It's like, okay, we're really out of Turkey and, and free again. We need your help as we continue this work here in the United States and around the world. Join us online at the American Center for Law and Justice at aclj.org. Live from Washington, D.C., Jay Sekulow Live. And now, your host, Jordan Sekulow. Welcome back to Jay Secchio Live. Thanks for joining us the second half hour of the broadcast. We've been talking to Walter Webber. Remember, we were joined by Leader Eccles from Oklahoma State Legislature about this great new law passed and signed. It is a bill that allows lawsuits against coercive abortionists. It is a pro-woman uh, law, and it, what it really does is it's, it, the bill defines there's a circumstance under which there's a wrongful death suit may be filed including if a doctor, one, performs an abortion on a minor without parental consent or ignores consent altogether, does not uh, go through with full legal cons consent. So it provides this civil action. And we believe, as Walter said, and as uh, Leader Eccles said, this could become a model for other states. But Walter, that final question, I didn't have time to ask you in the last segment, but I wanted to ask you now because we know the legal challenge is coming. What do you expect that to look like? Well, one of the things that we intentionally designed in going with the civil remedy is to make it difficult, if not impossible, for there to be a legal challenge. Um, I, we were talking briefly before the break about the uh, Supreme Court case, June Medical, that's raising the question of whether or not abortionists can stand in the shoes of their patients. The typical case, they claim that they are representing the women and they're challenging the state, the big bad state that's restricting their ability to do abortions and get abortions. In this case, the person who's going to be adverse to the abortion provider, the abortion business, is the woman who has been injured. And the law only targets abortions that are illegal or tortious. Tortious is a legal term, which means it violates civil law, like a malpractice suit or defamation, something like that. So you, you can't have the abortionist claiming to represent women when it's the women who are suing him saying, you hurt me, you lied to me, you, you took advantage of me when I, was, I was, had been drugged or I was uh, intoxicated in order to numb the pain of the impending abortion, and you went ahead and did the abortion anyway. And, and so now I'm coming for relief. You claim to represent me, saying you should be immune from these suits? Uh, that, not only is that a really bad theater in terms of the optics of, of it, but it's also a legal issue because it, as, as – our, our, I hope our listeners understand, you can only sue someone who poses an injury threat to you. The state is not doing anything to the abortion providers in this case. It would only be the person who sues. So it's like a defamation case. You can't say, well, a defamation suit, I'm going to sue everybody who could sue me for defamation because it might violate my free speech rights. You can't do that. You have to wait until you are sued. And then in a particular case, if it's an abuse of the, of the, the lawsuit, then you can defend. So in this case, the abortionist has to wait until they are sued by a woman, and the woman's going to say, your abortion was illegal or it was tortious. Well, what are they going to say? It's unconstitutional. I have a right to do illegal abortions. I have a right to do tortious abortions. I think that's a really weak argument for them to make, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if we don't see them suing. If they do sue, you know, well, then we'll argue, well, you don't have standing. You don't have, you don't, you don't have a valid suit because you're not suing someone who, who is adverse to you. You know, Walter, just kind of a, a final point. We're we're going to be ready if Oklahoma needs us to assist them in defending this because to defend if we defend it successfully, it could absolutely become this a new model for other states that are likely to support pro-life legislation to adopt because it's taking that civil action approach just very quickly, Walter. Yes, and and uh, we do have case law already that we've assembled that we're ready in case there is a lawsuit saying in jurisdiction after jurisdiction that you cannot sue the state over a civil cause of action. So if someone tries it, you know, we're going to tell them, hey, you're trying to invent new law, uh, you, you lose because you're not suing the people who are, who are going to sue you because you won't know who they are until they sue you. All right, folks. Walter, great work. You heard the praise from uh, Leader Eccles. Uh, I know great work to Ben Sisney as well. He'll be joining us later in the broadcast. Uh, Walter Weber really leads our efforts when it comes to pro-life work, and he's done an excellent job over 
a, t- a very long career and a tough career fighting against the abortion industry and fighting for the unborn children. Walter, it's great to have you on. Thank you for this work that you do in the federal level at the Supreme Court and in states across the country. Let's hope this does become a new model. Support the work of the ACLJ. It's how we get this work done. This work would not get done without your financial donations to the ACLJ. Donate online right now at aclj.org. That's aclj.org. And we've got some breaking news when we come back. When a woman gets pregnant, their motherly instincts just kick right into gear. It's how we're wired, it's how we're created, and and I short-circuited mine. I still remember staring up at that bright light and counting backwards from 10. It was very, very painful. I've never felt pain like that in my life. I remember the nurse giving me sedation and I, she just kept rubbing my arm, shushing me. I didn't want the baggage because I had a vision for my life and it didn't include children. When I found myself pregnant, Roe v. Wade had just happened. It was all in the news. I called my doctor. He said, no problem. We can take care of it. I was told that it was just a blob of tissue. I wasn't given any choices as far as ultrasounds or why don't you go home, think about it, and then come back. Nothing like that. There was nothing positive. When I stood up and I fainted, I think I fainted because of the horror of what I had done. I realized that I was missing a large part of me. I actually ended up being pretty volatile and and got a little physical with the nurse. I slapped her across the face. Um, And I remember because I didn't want anyone to see me. I I didn't want anyone to know. They don't let you walk back out the front. There's a private exit. And later on in life, I wondered, had I seen someone like me in the state I was in at that moment after that abortion walk out back out the front clinic? Maybe I wouldn't have done it. Five seconds. All right, folks. Uh, Again, let me encourage you to share this broadcast with your friends and family on Facebook and Periscope. More people need to know about this work that the ACLJ does. It's a great victory, but also about this work that we do with the states. And you're all listening in states across the country. So support our work, aclj.org. get right back to this great pro-life victory and if you've got questions about it uh it's a great time to call if you've got comments about it because ben sisney will be joining us he is another senior aclj attorney who helped uh the state legislators out there as you heard from leader Eccles and walter weber from our aclj legal team uh, uh that was assisting in putting together this legislation so if you've got questions about it and maybe how you could do it in your state call us now so you can get on the air with him, 1-800-684-3110. Now, you may also want to call about this breaking news because this is pretty important, Than Out of the Senate Judiciary Committee, let people know. I said we'd have breaking news. We come back from the break. We do. Tell people what it is. Yeah, breaking just now off the Hill, Jordan. The Senate Judiciary Committee has just authorized uh, the the authority of Chairman Graham to issue those 53 subpoenas we've talked about over the last couple of weeks. Remember, these are subpoenas uh, for individuals who invo- were involved in the origins of the Russia probe, also the FISA applications. Uh, also remember, the, the committee was able to come to a deal with Rod Rosenstein to deliver testimony last week uh, without issuing a subpoena. We will see whether or not they decide to subpoena him for additional information information. But Jordan, there are 52 other individuals that Chairman Graham will now have the authority to issue a subpoena for, both for their testimony, Jordan, in person, as well as documents relating to the origins of the Russia probe. So just now approved out of the Senate Judiciary Committee, I think this is very good news for transparency on not only who was involved, but in what they did. And Jordan, just final point I would make on this. We've been through this list of names. I would say about two thirds of them are names that our listeners would know. The other one third are maybe more interesting, Jordan, because they're names that have not yet really surfaced in the public. The committee is going to be talking to those individuals who maybe will have a vested interest in shining additional light and salvaging some of their reputation on this. So again, uh, authorization for up to 53 subpoenas coming out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Pretty big news. Before we go to Ben Sisney, are there a few that you just want to highlight some names people will know? Sure. Uh, uh, James Comey, Andrew yeah. McCabe, 
Peter Strzok, and, and Jordan, maybe one that some people wouldn't know. It also uh, authorizes a subpoena uh, for Kevin Kleinschmidt. He's the attorney who falsified an email to change an answer essentially from yes to no and then presented that evidence uh, to the FISA court. That'll be very interesting uh, testimony to receive. Uh, maybe one more, Jordan. Uh, how about Joseph Pienka, the other FBI agent who went over with Peter Strzok at James Comey's directions to interview General Flynn without doing what? without going through the White House counsel's office. It's going to be very interesting to see what he has to say. Think about that. Susan Rice, Clapper, uh, Loretta Lynch, Samantha Power, I, I mean, Bruce Orr, who we've never gotten to hear from publicly under oath, only behind closed doors, and got some transcript out of that. Peter Strzok, Lisa Page, Glenn Simpson from Fusion GPS. This is really serious, folks. So if you've got calls about that, you can call us about that as well. 1-800-684-3110. Uh, Than, just right before I get to Ben Sisney, uh, any timeline on, like, these subpoenas can start going out. Any timeline on when the committee might start holding hearings? I think you could expect a notice any day now, Jordan. One of the interesting things here, there was a the one-week delay in actually taking this vote, and I'm pretty confident now just from having talked to folks behind the scenes that one of the reasons for that was because there are ongoing negotiations with a number of these witnesses to see if maybe some of them will come forward voluntarily. So I think that's going to impact the timeline here. I think you will see some subpoenas issued quickly, uh, but Jordan, I actually think one of the reasons that some of them might not come out quickly is because I think, I think some of these folks are going to come forward voluntarily voluntarily now that the threat of the subpoena is out there right uh, is that attorney who altered the email on here yes that's kevin kleinschmidt kevin he is kleinschmidt, on there yeah, and uh he's I, gonna have I, a I lot to answer pretty, for <laughs> look if i i'm well I, i'm not going to give legal advice but i think he's going to come one way or another whether it's voluntarily or by force of subpoena yeah it will be interesting to see what he has to say like does he take the fifth or does he say i was instructed to do this by someone else that's why you put these big groups together, you never know what's going to happen, but this is going to be very interesting to follow. If you've got questions about that, too, I mean, we've got uh, this segment and another segment coming up, uh, and Than's got the, we've got the list in front of you, so we can keep going through it. 1-800-684-3110 to talk to us on the air. That's 1-800-684-3110. But I want to bring in Ben Sisney, because, Ben, we've heard from Walter Weber. Uh, we've heard from Leader Eccles. I want to read this from Oklahoma Senator uh, David Boulard about the bill. He said, with the passage of Senate Bill 1728, the Senate has taken Oklahoma Senate has taken a bold step in guaranteeing Oklahoma families their constitutional right to seek recourse through legal civil action to protect their families from wrongful death. Our federal and state constitutions, as well as codified statutes, guarantee every Oklahoman the right to civil recourse of wrongful death. This bill will finally add that forgotten family members to this guaranteed protect protection and bring justice for the multitude of wrong families across the state. I want to thank my colleagues uh, for their support. This passed overwhelmingly in the Senate and the House. It was signed by Governor Stitt. We had uh, Leader Eccles on. That's uh, Senator Bullard, who we also worked with. Uh, take us inside, Ben. Uh, Walter kind of explained, putting this together, how he looks at it, both will this be constitutional, and if so— uh, so that means, can we defend it in court? And if so, is it actually going to be meaningful? But take people inside uh, advising, you know, it put, going inside and working with these state legislators, because you do this a lot, uh, not just at this time in Oklahoma, but just to give a few examples, you've done it in Maryland, uh, you've done it in Ohio, uh, you're working on FOIA in Virginia, but, but you've done this pretty often. But, but tell us about this experience specifically. Hi, Jordan. Uh, wow, what a busy time for the ACLJ. Uh, even through the COVID situation, we, yeah. we've been hard at work. Uh, the, the situation in Oklahoma, first off, Oklahoma is my home state. I'm a proud Oklahoman. I'm so proud of Oklahoma and its leaders uh, for prioritizing life and empowering women. And, and what I mean by that is is empowering women with knowledge, with consent, protecting their, their legal rights to, uh, to receive all the information uh, it was such an honor to get to work with with the leaders there. Uh, so, so they reached out to us. Uh, they asked us for our advice and 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 um, uh, expertise to help craft, like Walter said, a bill that would pass legal scrutiny, uh, but that also would be meaningful. Um, we had a series of phone calls. Van Bennett uh, was was involved in some of the early calls, um, and uh, we helped work through this. Uh, uh, the process, and as you know, uh, the development of legislation is a lengthy 
process. You have to be patient. Uh, and uh, we ended up going out there, Walter and I, uh, for some meetings with some of the legislators, uh, John Eccles being one of them, um, and uh, just to, to hammer it out and, and get it done. Uh, it, it, it is for a number of reasons it will be constitutional. Walter went through some of that, so I won't repeat it. But uh, but I think it will also be meaningful. I mean, it, it's 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 all about consent, uh, voluntary uh, consent. And as you know, uh, under the law, there's not meaningful or real consent if there's not full disclosure. Um, and that's that's really all this does, and it, and it puts in place the accountability mechanisms um, to to see that through. And as you also know, uh, when when you have legal uh, avenues for legal recourse, um, that discourages, that disincentivizes uh, bad acts. Just having those, those those protections in place that can impact abortion in Oklahoma. Just this law being there. Uh, let alone uh, in the event that um, that someone uh, needs to sue under this under this new law, um, it, it's so encouraging to see how the leaders in Oklahoma, uh, Senator Bullard, uh, who was fantastic on this, John Eccles, Representative Tom Gann sponsored it in the House, and the Senate leadership, Pro Tem Greg Treat, House leadership, Speaker McCall, along with Majority Floor Leader Eccles. Uh, and, and, and many others. They were enthusiastic. They, they welcomed our help. Uh, they provided their own expertise and their own knowledge and experience in working together, which I, I just want to emphasize, Jordan, our members, our supporters in, enable that. They, they allow us to do exactly this, along with everything else the ACLJ does. But working together, sitting down, talking it out, um, and, and we ended up with this product, and the governor signed it, and it, it, it promotes life, it empowers women, and it, it's a success. And now, if and when it gets challenged in court somehow, we'll be there, just like you said. You know, uh, Ben, just very quickly, because this takes resources for us to mobilize and for us to – for these legislators to know who we are, to know to call us, to contact us, and to know that we can come help them and it doesn't cost them a thing. And the reason why – been is because our donors support our work that's right that's right and 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 this is just just one of many examples of that work in action uh y'all mentioned earlier boots on the ground that's what it takes boots on uh, and, the, and boots and, on the ground that's right. financial resources and victories for life around the country ben sisney thank you for your excellent work on this in, both federally uh with the foia work testifying in maryland uh, going into, into Oklahoma. Keep it up in the battle for life. And folks, help him do that. Help Walter keep doing it. Help our team. As Ben said, we've been really busy, just as busy as always, regardless of the pandemic. And you can support our work because we can't do any of it without your financial donations. Donate to the ACLJ.org right now at ACLJ.org. Donate to the American Center for Law and Justice at ACLJ.org so that we can do this work, so that we can be brought in to be the experts to defend life. Donate online at aclj.org. We'll be right back. IRS now uh, formally apologizing to Tea Party groups. The IRS did the right thing by resolving the case with an injunction that mandated a complete change of the IRS nonprofit tax exempt work as it relates to issue advocacy organization. If any group feels like they're being targeted, they can go to federal court and bring our case. That's a victory. It's one of the most significant wins in the ACLJ's history to take on the IRS and win. For more than 27 years, the ACLJ has been fighting for freedom and liberty in the United States and around the globe. These are our young people in their 20s and 30s that are doing this, are fighting for life at a whole new level to beat back the abortion juggernaut. We've got a whole group of young lawyers that are defending them. Those of us that believe in life know that we're on the right side of history. We understand full well children are children, and they're precious in God's sight, and they're precious in our nation's sight, and they're precious to parents. But I actually think we're winning. This is one of the social issues we're winning. The release of Andrew Brunson. He is the American evangelical from North Carolina, held in Turkey, for more than two years. They're rushing us to the airport, and uh, there was an Air Force plane that came from Germany that had been on standby. We're flying, and they finally left Turkish airspace. It's like, okay, 
Now we're really, we're really out of Turkey and, and free again. We're grateful to ACLJ who put it out to these people, you know, who were, they were getting all this out. All of the people who prayed for us through ACLJ and through your contacts, I'm thankful, I'm grateful, and actually I'm astounded. We need your help as we continue this work here in the United States and around the world. Join us online at the American Center for Law and Justice at aclj.org. Preview of tomorrow's broadcast. A, a uh, candidate for U.S. Senate, former ambassador to Japan, who was uh, nominated by President Trump. He's been endorsed by President Trump, but uh, he, he put out a message on, on his social media, and I thought it resonated with me. I think it, it might eventually even become a bumper sticker uh, for his campaign, and I'm sure others across the country could adopt the same message, and maybe you'll want to adopt the same message. And we're going to get into a kind of more than just what the message means, but the but what it what it really you know the information behind it, and that's how about defund Planned Parenthood, not our police, and we're going to explain why we're going to explain why that's so important. How many minority children are killed at the hands of Planned Parenthood? How many black babies lose their life at the hands of Planned Parenthood? And we can't shy away from these battles. In these times when people are calling for social justice, how about social justice for those black children in the womb? So let's let's defund Planned Parenthood, not our police. That doesn't mean we believe there shouldn't be reforms to the police force. That doesn't mean we, uh, we, we totally agree that those officers involved in the murder of George Floyd should be held fully accountable. And we understand the protest around the country. I'm glad to see that those riots have calmed down and the focus is back on George Floyd and improving policing in the United States, especially for uh, minority communities. Uh, let me uh, first uh, go back to what Than announced with the Senate Judiciary Committee. I've got the, the release now in front of me. And Than, we've got a call about this uh, from Pamela in Kentucky on line one. Pamela, welcome to Jay Secchio Live. You're on the air. Thank you. My question is, on the 53 subpoenas, will the hearings be televised? So, Than, this is this is interesting. <clears throat> a lot of these people have testified behind closed doors. Some have not. Is there a plan yet to televise these? Yeah, th this is a great question, Jordan. Let me just explain how this process is going to work a little bit. What happened today in the Senate Judiciary Committee was not that all of the subpoenas got issued. What they did was vote to grant the chairman the authorization to issue them. And Jordan, they will not be issued all at once, nor should they. Here's what they'll do. They'll decide which piece of information they need next. And I can think of uh, several natural choices after Rod Rosenstein's testimony. I mean, one of them would be Andy McCabe, who, who they now have a dispute on what the truth is. Well, maybe they want to bring in Andy McCabe to see what he has to say, and maybe that'll naturally set up this the scenario. Uh, so they are going to probably proceed one or a few at a time in issuing the subpoenas for both testimony and documents. They will take that information, and then they will see uh, a chart a path forward from there. To the caller's question about whether or not they would be televised, Jordan, my expectation would be that the default would be what you saw when it came to Rod Rosenstein, that it would be in person. Maybe some of the senators would be, be joining uh, via satellite because of the COVID fit situation. But Jordan, I can also anticipate a situation where maybe some of these individuals who are either still working a case or they want to talk about classified information where you might have to have a, a certain session that was behind closed doors. But Jordan, the, the, the chairman has said this from the very beginning. His main goal is transparency so that the attorney general can do his job in holding people accountable. I think in that interest, he will have as many of these in public and on television as possible. Uh, Jordan, it brings to mind what the attorney general said the other day. Some of these are names you'll be familiar with. A lot of these 53, Jay, uh, Jordan, are people that our listeners know. Folks, uh, let me, I mean, just think about this. I mean, Andy McCabe basically accused Rod Rosenstein of perjury, said he lied, you know, during his testimony under oath. So you got to bring in Andy, Andy McCabe. But these are some big folks. Jim Comey, uh, James Clapper, John Brennan, Sally Yates, under oath, and includes people like Peter Strzok and Lisa Page. 
and Bruce Orr and those uh, justice attorneys, FBI attorneys who were altering evidence going to the FISA court. What you know? Are they going to take the fifth? Um, are they going to claim that they were just following someone else's orders to do that? And remember, I think as Than pointed out, Than, it's not just about the great thing about these subpoenas is not just about testimony. It's about documents as well, documents and communications and testimony. Yeah, absolutely. And there'd be several documents I could think of right now. How about, uh, you know, the fully unredacted emails from Kevin Kleinschmidt? We know he already altered one. Did he alter others? Think about uh, documents from Sally Yates, who was in that January 5th White House meeting. Does she have uh, memos from that time documenting that conversation? Jordan, what about this individual? What about Mary McCord, who worked for Sally Yates? And allegedly, Sally Yates said that she wasn't briefed by Mary McCord. Uh, Mary McCord then represented Sally Yates as she testified, uh, gave her deposition position to the House Intel Committee. She also worked for Chairman Adam Schiff in coordinating with uh, the whistleblower to present uh, the whole impeachment narrative. So, Jordan, does she have documents that would be relevant to this? Will she come voluntarily to testify or will a subpoena have to issue? So, look, some of the biggest uh, uh, blockbuster information, Jordan, might not come out of the big names because, quite frankly, we already know about many, many troubling actions taken by Jim Comey and Andy McCabe and Peter Strzok and Lisa uh, Lisa Page. But, Jordan, there were others who took actions to enable this process that we don't know as much about. We might get the most information from some of those individuals. All right. So, folks, uh, again, uh, people have got calls about this, about Judge Sullivan as well. Remember, th- this is also a, a getting interesting because uh, we haven't gotten into a lot, but the outside lawyer that Judge Sullivan appointed as a special prosecutor put forward his 87-page brief, uh, of course, criticizing the Department of Justice, and he recommends sentencing Michael Flynn on the existing charge. John Gleason uh, just goes after the Department of Justice. Uh, I, you know, I don't even want to take too much time because I want to kind of see – than how the court of appeals deals with this, uh, because I I think there's a possibility uh, the court of appeals says enough of this. Uh, the the liberal media might like these headlines for a day, but the truth is uh, that this could be over with pretty soon. Hopefully, man, I hope so. Yeah, I hope so, Jordan. I mean, I think the court gave Judge Sullivan one opportunity already to face safe, and the, and the judge did not take that opportunity. Hopefully, uh, the, uh, he will not be given another opportunity. Hopefully, it will be taken out of his uh, purview. But, you know, Jordan, we've heard so many analogies about the judge is supposed to be an umpire. Um, you know, I'm a bit of a baseball guy. I was a catcher growing up, and I was not allowed to play catcher and shortstop at the same time. I certainly wasn't allowed to play catcher and shortstop and also pitcher and also umpire at the same time. To me, that's what Judge Sullivan is trying to do here. I think I think it would be appropriate for the D.C. Circuit uh, Court to uh, to correct that remedy. We'll put it nicely. Uh, I hope that's what happens. It's going to be very interesting to follow tomorrow, though, Jordan. Very interesting indeed. Now, Than, I just wanted to kind of follow off with with just this. We talked about this great victory for life in Oklahoma. We're going to talk about this this other kind of movement. I think uh, tomorrow on the broadcast for life. Uh, you know, instead of uh, talking about defunding police, how about defunding Planned Parenthood and the and we'll go through the statistics as we've gone through before, but I think it's a critical time to do it. Uh, but all of this work that we do at the ACLJ, you know, just explain it to people quickly. All the work you do on Capitol Hill, uh, and again, uh, with the staff that we've got there, with the team that we've got there, all the work our team is doing around the country, it's all because of donors. You know, uh, these states bring us in. They don't have huge budgets in these state legislators to bring in big, powerful law firms. But they can bring in the best, that's the ACLJ attorneys, at no cost to them because of our donors. Same thing goes for our government affairs team. And Jordan, if the work that we do on a federal level here from this office is going to have an impact on the state and local level, if it's going to save lives, we've got to have the resources to put the boots on the ground to make sure that the policies that flow out of Washington, D.C. are then mirrored or improved on on the state level so that a mother who is wrongfully coerced into an abortion, Jordan, so that that mother has legal recourse. That is a real result. All right, folks, donate to the ACLJ today. Donate online at aclj.org. Make your financial contribution. Donate.